Bob Lidden, who, of course, as I mentioned, is an expert on, on finances. Uh, he's an experienced management consultant, both privately and with Price Waterhouse Coopers, and a specialization in banking and payments. He's also published numerous papers about financial mechanisms in the EU uh, through the Bruges Group, Politea, and Global Britain. And of course, as well as being a finance uh, expert, he looks at football as well. And the uh, very awful case, really, that uh, many Premier League and other league clubs find themselves in. And of course, he's wrote about uh, who will drain the swamp of English professional football. And we'll be talking about this further to us now. Bob. Yes, thank you very much, Robert. Well, I don't think this, um, the white paper, takes back control because I, my belief is the hijackers are still running the plane. They're still in the driver's seat. To me, the, the white paper is like a penalty shootout where it's nil-nil and each side has had five shots. You know, they had an open goal here, the government, five, ten sh shots at it, and then they've all missed. But I'm just going to pick out six, six main points. Firstly, it's not retrospective. Secondly, there seems to be an awareness of the measures available to combat financial crime. But the way they're mentioned in the report implies their implementation would just be half-baked in this case. There's a failure to capture the global dimensions of these businesses that are the, now the premiership clubs. These are global businesses. And there's a failure to set English football in the global context of the rich and the powerful. In fact, from what I can see, poor practice is the norm. You know, we, the, the report bangs on about reckless decisions. Well, how do you isolate a reckless decision that's out of the ordinary when idiocy is the norm. And lastly, what happens when a club fails the licensing? It goes bust, it can't play, it goes bust. So that precipitates exactly what we're looking to avoid. Those are the headings. Firstly, it's not retrospective. This is my first point. The uh, tests will only be applied to prospective owners of direct and directors. Incumbent owners will only have to notify changes. How many clubs believe that their current owner is a fit custodian of what's of their club? To me, they should be they, and I mean it's quite a wide range of people, should be put through the whole anti-money laundering sheep dip now as the first step to see how many pass and how many fail. And that takes me on to the measures for combating financial crime, because these measures are already available, not through the clubs, but through the banks, accountants, estate agents, lawyers who serve them, who are all so-called obliged entities under anti-money laundering legislation. Now we have tests like ultimate beneficial owner it has to be declared. No, no, that's not the test. They have to come into the office with their passport, gas bill, electricity bill, council tax bill, and go through personal identification. Just and declaring them, that achieves nothing. We have the concept of a pet, politically exposed person. That's not just about political affiliation. You know, one of the big six clubs, there could be 100 or 200 people who would classify as a pet, politically exposed person, if it was left to somebody like me to define that and put them all through the, uh, the test. It's not just the owner, it's not just the emir of wherever, the top man, the president. It's the entire family, agents, middlemen, hundreds of them, and finally, enhanced due diligence, it's not just about source of wealth, it's about an awful lot more than that. So the way these concepts are mentioned, they are mentioned, but they're mentioned in about a 20th of their actual import and scope. Then let's go on to the failure to set English football in a global context of the rich and the powerful. Where's the word sport washing? 
Are we not aware that the Premier League, the English football, has been subjected to the most gargantuan sport washing operation? There's no mention at all of club ownership being perhaps the first landing point of a foreign potentate. It's part and parcel of obtaining UK citizenship. This is a hop, skip and a jump. Club ownership, UK citizenship for the owner, UK citizenship for the family. Wealth then moves across from wherever it was obtained and however it was obtained. Um, and one of the main things in sport washing and getting UK citizenship is getting the ring fence of the UK legal system around whatever and however that wealth has been obtained. Um, the English football has become an absolute central point in gaining that landing point. In addition, next one, failure to capture global dimensions of revenues and costs. So, okay, we see all the costs landing in the UK because that's all right. They're all tax deductible, including interest on owner loans. That should not be tax deductible. That was a big issue at Derby. There were all sorts of disguised loans through intermediaries, not directly from the owner, but through two or three layers of intermediaries. But where do the, the revenues land? For example, you know, if in IT, if you are somebody like Amazon, or Google, all your licenses and intellectual property are vested in Ireland or Luxembourg, Panama sunny places with shady people as it's known in the trade and who's to say where all the revenues for shirt sponsorship and image sponsorship land because i bet pounds to a penny they don't land in the club in england so there's a myopia in this thing as to the dimensions of revenue where those land in the extended ecosystem that each of these clubs is and i mentioned poor practice is the norm because the whole structure is rife with the usual boring paraphernalia of tax havens, shell companies, corporate secrecy, nominee directors, layer upon layer of non-natural persons. What I mean is you, you and I and all of us, we are natural persons, but you can insert layers of trusts, partnerships, heaven knows what, in between the usual paraphernalia. And in all of that, what's normal? Do we, the fans, do fans think that is normal behaviour, that their club is owned through Panama and Belize and heaven knows where? Is that normal? But that's the norm. So what counts as reckless? What's going to stick out such that the regulator will say, oh, that's not normal in all of that? And what's the end state we're looking at? You know, if they, there is no end state, if this licensing system comes up, what is football supposed to look like 15 years out? Does it look pretty much the same as it does today? Because if you don't do anything about what's happening now, what's happened in the past, and just say we just test prospective owners, prospective directors, and only owners have to say something's changed, well, then nothing changes, except every now and again. And I noticed with quite a smile how there was a bit in the uh, thing in 4.9 of the white paper. Oh, we might have a particularly difficult regime for a newly promoted Premier League club with high costs funded through owner subsidies. That's my team, Nottingham Forest. Hyperlink to the Forest Annual Report. Yeah, if we don't stay up, this club could be done. You know, they've made su taken such a risk what happens there? Do they lose their, would they lose their license? Then forests go out of existence. Well, that's a licensing system. If you lose your license, you, f you f go flat on your face, which is supposedly what this licensing system is meant to avoid. So I don't see where any of this goes. I find it, as with so much, so depressing to see an apparent minuscule awareness of things like ultimate beneficial ownership about enhanced due diligence, but actually the warhead on which the, the, this is mounted has got nothing in it. It's got an ounce of gunpowder and actually the plane has been hijacked. 
don't we want to get the hijackers off the plane now and not just say, oh, we can't have any more in? Or, well, they can come in as long as they're not, they've got this size of grenade. And if any grenade up to this size, they can come in. Any uh, 0.22 rifle they can bring on, but not a 303. Is that, is that it? Because what I do now, right now, I've set up an anti-money laundering task force. I identify all the current service providers to the Premier League, accountants, estate agents, lawyers, banks, and I'd go through their anti-money laundering due diligence for the last 10 years on every single club that's been in the Premier League after the, over the last 10 years. I'd put in a whistleblower hotline and I'd have to have some kind of uh, immunity, some kind of permanently valid immunity from these lawsuits where the rich and powerful try to suppress stories that put them in a bad light. So we actually need a task force now to do what should have been done before the white paper, which is because the powers exist, no laws need to be put through, existing obliged entities that service the Premier League and have done so for the last 10 years need to go through the sheet deck and we will see who turns up on this side of the pages, they are fit and proper, or there's nothing adverse is known. And the ones over this side, oh, whoops, we wonder whether they should be involved. So that's what I do. I think the whole thing's extremely disappointing. A lot of hullabaloo and actually primed to fail, designed to fail, 